Excellent! So I'm sure we've all been in this situation before. You're preparing to go out of town and suddenly an NVIDIA package shows up on your door and you have a new graphics card to review. This is the GeForce GTX 1050 Ti just launched from NVIDIA. They sent over this MSI variant right here. So I guess I have no... Ch One sec. So I was going to say I will do a quick look at the 1050 Ti because that's all I have time for, uh, but I suppose I'll also be doing a cursory glance at the GTX 1050 since both are now out today. The 1050 costs $109 MSRP, US dollars, and uh, the 1050 Ti is coming in at uh, $139 MSRP. Let's start out by looking at the specs. So both of these graphics cards are based on GP107, a new GPU in the Pascal family from NVIDIA, and there's only a slight variance between the 1050 and the 1050 Ti. Also very sturdy, both of these cards, and only slightly prone to falling over. Anyway though, apart from being based on GP107, the 1050 Ti at least has two graphics processing clusters and six streaming multiprocessors. That gives you 768 CUDA cores, 48 texture units, and 32 ROP units. The base clock is 1290 and the boost clock is 1392 megahertz, although as is the case often with cards in this range, the manufacturers will often ship them at higher frequencies than what Nvidia gives you for the base and boost clocks. Memory clock is 3504 megahertz and that gives you seven gigabits per second of total memory data rate. And lastly, the biggest difference between these two cards is gonna be that the 1050 Ti has a four megabyte frame buffer and the 1050 has just a two megabyte frame buffer. So that's pretty cut down. Although both of them are operating on a 128 bit memory interface for 112 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. Uh, Pascal, by the way, is 14 nanometer manufacturing process, 3.3 billion transistors on the GP107 in either case, and then for display outs on either one, you also have the same options of one display port, one HDMI, and one dual link DVI, which is a nice variety, I suppose, for a card of this caliber. Now, the benefits of the lower power, lower cost cards like this is they're often easy to drop into an existing system. Thanks to the fact that these only draw 75 watts of power, which is the same amount of power that's delivered uh, natively through the PCI Express bus, neither of these has extra supplemental power connectors. So all you gotta do, just plug in the plug in the card. <laughs> Hopefully not knock it over like I've been doing, and it should just work for you. Uh, presuming you have you know a compatible system and install the drivers and everything like that, which is cool. Now there are, like I said, a bunch of different variations of this card. These from MSI were sent to me directly by Nvidia, uh, but I also have been hit up by ASUS, Gigabyte. EVGA, there's lots of others available. There's a ton of even pictures of them out right now. And what you're basically gonna be seeing is short cards like these right here, which you're only gonna run in the maybe five to seven inches long range, easy to fit into small form factor computers and don't take much additional power. And then you're also gonna see variants that ha are bigger, have larger cooling solutions, dual fans, and possibly also the addition of a PCI Express power connector for additional power, which would theoretically give you more overclocking headroom. I didn't have time to overclock these cards, but I did run some benchmarks on the 1050 Ti uh, running at the out of the box speeds. And I did test this in the system that's right back here that I've recently used in my how to build a computer series rather than the 6950X based system out there over there, which just would be quite overkill for these cards. Anyway, that system is running on a V150 Pro 4V motherboard from ASRock. It's a micro ATX system. I did run all the tests with everything enclosed and whatnot. Uh, it's on an i5 60. 500 quad core CPU uh, from Intel, 16 gigs of DDR4 memory from Corsair, and I ran all of these tests at 1920 by 1080 because for these cards, that's really what you should be looking at. 1440 and beyond, you're probably going to be looking at something a little bit more powerful in order to handle that resolution. Starting right at though with 3D Mark Fire Strike Extreme, we hit 3377 overall on the score, 3600 on the graphics, 7050 on the physics, and 1504 on the combined score. 
3D Mark Time Spy, which is a DirectX 12 test, came in at 2,379 for the overall score, 2,272 for the graphics, and 3,246 for the CPU. Grand Theft Auto V, a very popular game. I certainly enjoy playing it myself. Uh, using the built-in benchmark, it got 61.9 average frames per second. That's using my default settings for the benchmark, which includes uh, 2x MSAA and pretty much all of those extra stuff set to very high when it comes to the extra configuration stuff you can do with the graphics. Since 61.9 in real world was actually ended up being more like 50 to 60 frames per second, I found out that just by turning off 2x MSAA, I was achieving more like 70 to 75 frames per second, so easily playable at over 60 FPS uh, with a $140 graphics card, so that's pretty nice, with most of the eye candy turned on too. Overwatch is not a very challenging game to play, but lots of people are interested in playing this game because it's very popular, and also playing it at higher uh, frame rates if you're interested in getting perhaps a higher refresh rate monitor, for example. Happy to say that using ultra settings, I hit 102.8 average frames per second and 83 minimum frames per second. So again, very playable with this card for the very popular game Overwatch. CSGO, again, a game I'm imagining lots of people might be interested in this card for. Again, also looking for really high frame rates if you're looking for 144 hertz or beyond. Fortunately, with all the settings maxed, 180 frames per second was in the low range of what I was seeing. Average was around 190 to 220 frames per second. So really high frame rates achievable and you should have no problem playing CSGO with this card. Finally, I did uh, try out Doom using the Vulcan API. Uh, again, testing at 1080 with ultra settings and I found I was able to hit 60 to 80 frames per second as you can see here in this riveting live gameplay footage as I kill demons and that sort of thing. Incredibly fun. So, uh, first things first, what did I notice about the benchmarks? I noticed that 4 gigs is good for 1080. 2 gigs, not that I've tested this card, is not enough, at least for the games that I was testing. Half of the games that I ran used more than 2 gigs frame buffer. In fact, I used 2.6 gigabytes in Time Spy, 2.8 gigabytes in Doom, 3.3 gigabytes in GTA 5, which can often be a memory hog as it's loading up your environment that's all around you and that kind of thing. Temperatures, fortunately, were very, were very nice. 63 degrees Celsius is what I hit using this card, again, with everything running at just at the out-of-box speeds. Uh, fan speed was going in the 45 to 50% range to achieve those temperatures and was not loud at all. Uh, that's just anecdotal, sorry I didn't do a sound test officially for this one. So let's round this video out with some conclusions for the 1050 Ti. Again, the 1050 just arrived and I'm not having time to benchmark it, so uh, perhaps more on this coming in the future. But the 1050 Ti, uh, I thought was a really nice performer at 1080, and if you're looking to get into PC gaming, having an entry-level graphics card that you can rely on to play games at 1080 and get really decent frame rates even in the higher end games like GTA 5 and Doom. This card seems totally capable of that. It definitely seems, again I didn't do apples to apples comparison, but it seems like it's beating out the RX 460 from AMD on their side. So given that the RX 460 4 gig costs uh, 140 bucks right now, and you might see that price perhaps drop down a little bit to have it slot in a little bit better against the 1050 Ti. On the con side though, these are definitely still very much budget video cards. For instance, if you look at the CUDA core count, 768 CUDA cores on the 1050 Ti uh, and then 640 CUDA cores on the 1050. The 1050 has one less streaming multiprocessor, five instead of six. So that's why you get less CUDA cores, only 40 texture units, um, although you do get a bit higher clock speed with the 1050, 1354 is the base and 1455 is the boost clock. Uh, memory configuration is the same apart from the actual amount of memory. So there you have it. I definitely lean much more towards recommending the 1050 Ti. I just like having that additional memory in there as well as just a little bit more performance at the close to the metal level with a few more CUDA cores. But don't fool yourself into thinking that these cards are like close to like a GTX 1060, the next step up from Nvidia where you're spending more in the range of $250. They are definitely not. The 1060, for example, has 1,280 CUDA cores. Not quite double, but close to double the amount that this one has in it. So you are gonna see a pretty huge jump in performance if you're going for a $200 to $250 card versus these, which are more in the $100 to $150 range. 
All that said though, I think it's nice that you can spend about 140 bucks and get yourself really solid 1080 performance out of the 1050 Ti. I hope this video has helped you guys out and given you a little bit better idea of what to expect if you are investing in this graphics card. So leave me a comment in the comment section down below and let me know what you think about these GPUs. Uh, there also be links to these in the video description. You can also hit the thumbs up button and let me know if you enjoyed the video while you're down there. That helps me out a ton. Also, a link is down there for my store where you can buy t-shirts like this one. Yes, I'm actually wearing one of my t-shirts today, so check that out. Help support the cause. Thanks for watching, guys, and we'll see you next time.